Welcome to the Student Pilot Podcast. My name is Simon Callis, a flight school owner. Each week, myself and my guests will be talking all things flight training and beyond to help inspire, motivate and support you on your journey to becoming a private or commercial pilot. Today we have uh, former airline pilot and world record holder, Derek Clues. Welcome, Derek. How are you? Very well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me on. Yeah, no problem at all. So you've got a really interesting aviation career, which is why we invited you on. From working on helicopters to a bush pilot, airline pilot, instructor and world record holder. So let's go straight in and tell us about that world record. Well, I was uh, working with Western Helicopters, flight test engineer, and uh, I was doing what we normally do, which is you know, conducting trials, reporting on them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was working on a particular section of flying, which was to do with a new rotor system. And this uh, trial was like a full-scale test, really, on a smaller helicopter for this new rotor system. And that was looking very good. Um, the results from the trials ended up telling us that we could probably actually do a world speed record. And so the company at the time were kind of interested in doing one, but it had to be quick and it had to be relatively cheap. Mm-hmm. So we got a dedicated team together and I was included in that uh, to just run through it in a single month. Yeah. And so from beginning to end, from the first tracking and hover trials all the way through to the actual speed record just took a month. Wow. And uh, we got to 400.87 kilometers an hour. And that's, that record still stands, isn't it? That's the current record, yeah, 36 oh, wow. years later. Okay, so um, let's talk about right back to the start then when you mm. first started learning to fly. So you started on gliders, is that correct? Uh, that's right, yes. Um, like many youngsters at the time, I joined the Air Training Corps uh, as soon as you could. The age of 13 was normally the earliest. Um, and we had air experience flying, uh, which was quite good. We was in chipmunks at the time, uh, but also gliding on the, mm-hmm. the T21s. Um, so I ended up getting a gliding course and I went solo uh, on the T21 when I was 16. Oh, okay. Um, and then on to powered aircraft after that? Uh, yeah, so when I was um, doing my degree, my aeronautical engineering degree, I wanted to continue with it and mm-hmm. I got a situation where I could actually start my PPL while I was at yeah. university. So that's what oh, I did. Okay. Mm-hmm. Wow, okay. Um, so that training journey, how long did it take you to get your PPL? Do you remember? Oh, from beginning to end of the PPL was probably about nine months. It was relatively okay. condensed. That's pretty short, isn't it? Yes. Really? No, that's pretty yes. good. Um, so one thing everyone kind of remembers is their first solo flight. And I guess really you had two first solos, one in yes. the glider, one in the powered aircraft. Um, does that really stick in your mind at all, the actual flight itself? Or? It, it was a long time ago, but yeah. um, the, the glider was a sort of week-long course and so it's quite intensive and you were just yeah. doing what you were doing until you got to the solo and that was the end of the course yeah. um, and so yes it's exciting when you go solo uh, you know, there yeah. is an ad- adrenaline rush but uh, it, it didn't seem like it was a step too far or anything because yeah. you were immersed in it at the time absolutely now that's one thing we obviously do our fast track training which now as an instructor here you're involved in um, do you think that has great benefits in doing intensive training over over doing it over a long period of time oh most certainly yes i, yeah. I think if you uh, do uh, less and less intensive training you get mm-hmm. to a point where you're just trying to recover the um, information and skills that you had previously yeah and so it really slows your progress yeah but whereas if you can actually do it at just the right pace mm-hmm. and assimilate correctly you can really speed through it yeah absolutely i guess you've got less time to backtrack with the training less time to kind of even lose um you know get some sort of skill erosion haven't you i yeah. think um i know when i first started it was like once a month and i felt i felt like it's going through treacle it was really slow <laughs> once a month is pretty poor <laughs> yeah it? it's poor yeah um so then um Let's talk about your commercial flight training. So how long after your PPL did you start commercial flight training? Ah, that's, that was a bit difficult because I, I did the self-improver route, which was mm-hmm. available at the time to me. Um, so I built experience, gained another rating, built experience, gained another rating, and yeah. I became an instructor. Okay. And then I could really hours build as an instructor. Yes. And yeah. so that was a method. You had to get to 700 hours. Yeah. And then you yeah. could take all the commercial flight tests and okay. the ground tests. So that's slightly different to the routes that are available now, but I guess the closest thing it would be available now is probably the modular type route is the closest thing that's... That's right, yes. Yeah. And I, 
from our point of view, that worked. I was married. We yeah. were starting a family, you know, getting a house, et cetera, et cetera, during that time. So I was working. So it was yeah. a case of, of earning the money and spending the money. Earning yeah. And spending the money. All on flight liked. training. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so after your commercial training, what was your first commercial job? A bit unusually, my first commercial job actually was bush flying in Africa with wow. Mission Aviation Fellowship. Yeah. So tell us about, about that job. Um, it's unusual from the point of view that it's a charity. You have to raise money. So you have to have supporters to go out there. It involves the whole family. And of course, you're yeah. locating to a different country. So it's, it's a very different experience in that way. Um, at the time, Tanzania was uh, still very, very poor in need of quite a lot of development help. Mm-hmm. Um, and the flying we were doing was essential, really, to a lot of the people there. Yeah. We were doing very essential tasks, carrying basic items and carrying yeah. people, medicines. Yeah, so that's, you, you know, you, I guess there's a real um, sense of how important what your job is to the, the people, really, is mm-hmm. that you, you're delivering food and aid and, and, and passengers as well sometimes yeah. as well. And did you say there was some medical uh, angle of it as well? You sometimes fly in uh, patients and things? Uh, yes, what, what we would do was um, effectively were air taxi, so it yeah. was as requested. Um, yeah. One of the uh, first places I went to, for instance, I was flying the 185 uh, tail yeah. dragger, yeah. and we were going out to, to strips, and one of the regular routines we do every month was a, a set of baby and mother clinics, and yeah, they'd okay. be going around doing vaccinations, for instance, health checks, that sort of stuff. Wow. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you'd come across people who were actually sick and needed to go to hospital, so you'd be flying yeah. them out as well. Yeah. But you're always on call to do a medical flight anyway. Yeah. One thing that I really liked watching was the Bush Pilot series, um, Bush Pilots even series. And obviously that's considerably, uh, you know, a few years later than when you did it. Um, yeah. And so, I, you know, when you did it, there was no GPS. It was all... No, um, we were doing it on a classic Bush aircraft that had yeah. been flying in that environment for like 20 years or so. Yeah. Um, Robertson stalled yeah. uh, Cessna. And um, yes, it, it was the old fashioned navigation. So all you had were, you know, okay. maps. Yeah, compass, stopwatch. And so I guess you're more, more reliant on the just time and heading kind of method rather yes. than recognising things on the ground because there might be miles and miles where there's nothing to see. Yes, I mean, we were in a bush environment and there weren't yeah. necessarily any particular features which were unique to that area for a long time. So um, did you ever, did that ever worry? Did you ever feel like you were lost on any occasions? Or? Um, it's like they say, you're temporarily uncertain of your position, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. um, there were features around and there were uh, things that you could orientate to after a period of time. And so d- yeah. you, you could find your way around quite um, simply when you were used to it. Yeah. But it's a bigger scale. The distances are larger, the times are longer. Yeah. Um, for instance, if, if I was doing, bearing in mind it's a single engine, single pilot, non-autopilot, yeah. um, the longest uh, legs I, I flew normally in Tanzania were three and a half hours in one direction. Right. In, in heat and things as well. It's, yes. Yeah. It's, um, so one of the things that I found quite amazing about the Bush Pilot series was the conditions they fly in some of the landing strips and things. You wouldn't, you know, if you had an engine failure in this country and you saw that landing strip, you'd be thinking that doesn't look ideal, but these, <laughs> you were planning to land on it, you know. Um, yes. So, you know, there was water, log conditions, all kinds of stuff. T- tell us a bit, you know, about, about that. Yeah, so we... We ended up in a situation, I suppose, where the local people who were you know, relatively simple villagers um, had to own the landing strip and we were going yeah. on the ground to set up a landing strip with them and yeah. show them how to do it. But you might only go once a month and so yeah. the conditions, termites, yeah. vegetation, erosion from different seasons, yeah. uh, they, that could all be happening in that intervening period. So we ended up with practices to, to keep the airstrip going and to encourage yeah. them to keep working on it. But one of the most... Um, restrictive, I suppose, ones that I used to go to, was, was actually um, a single-way st- strip. So okay. you could only land uphill, only take off downhill. Right, okay. It was um, on, on a relatively short, uh, what, 350 metres sort of length as well. Wow. So uh, what you used to have to do there was fly over, and once they saw the aeroplane, they'd come and take the goalpost down <laughs> from, their, <laughs> from their football pitch, <laughs> clear the way, and then you'd land... Up uphill, across a bit of a field, yeah. onto the football pitch, wow. up to the walls of the houses, at 350 metres ahead of you, and you had to stop wow. to do that. You'd have to turn around, of course, and then yeah. take off back down the hill, regardless of the wind direction. Yeah. <laughs> and um, 
apart from the conditions you're landing in, I guess the weather conditions can be fairly variable because you're going yeah, from, from wet to dry areas yeah. and things. And uh, Being Africa, it's different to here. It's continental weather. Yeah. And yes, the north of Tanzania was actually too wet and too dry. The yeah. south was actually single wet, single dry. Yeah. Um, and because you would fly some longer distances, you could on any particular day go from one season to the next. Wow. Uh, were there so quite wild fun. thunderstorms and things you're having to deal with? And the wet season would give you those lovely tropical storms that you yeah. hear about and see on, on the TV. Yes. Yeah, well. But of okay. course, with no GPS and no weather service or anything, you're yeah, pretty much on your own with your eyeballs. So yeah, that, <laughs> getting that around looks it. dangerous. We'll keep clear of that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Um, so tell us about your commercial journey that followed after that. So when, when you finished in a bush flying, what did you move on to then? Uh, when we came home, I had another decision point, really, like we had when we went out there. And I could have gone back into engineering. I was offered jobs back with Western mm-hmm. Helicopters. Um, or I could sort of strike out into what wasn't looking very good at the time in the industry. Okay. Um, I did get an opportunity to go up to Aberdeen and to fly all okay. workers out to Sumbra. Yeah. Um, and so I took that up. Yeah. And those days it was fairly normal for people to pay for your type ratings. So that was an encouragement as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I was flying the ATR-72 then, yeah, the okay. first officer with British World. Yeah. And what was the job you did after that one? Um, not too long after that, Bryman Airways, as it mm-hmm. was at the time, came along and they opened up um, another service in Aberdeen, but it was yeah. a regular passenger service. Um, so I transferred across as a direct entry captain with them. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. And, and then was it Flybe after that, was it? Or? Yes, the, the, the company I was with basically merged and um, changed, I suppose, uh, across the years. Um, okay. And then after about 10 years, Flybe bought it. Yeah, and so I, I came into Flybe through four different companies, really, <laughs> without changing jobs. And was it Dash Eight and Embraer One Nine Five? Is it you? Were? Yeah, I, I started on the uh, Dash Three Hundred mm-hmm. series, which is the fifty seater Dash, yeah. and then onto the little Embraer, which was the One Four Five, which is the okay. twin rear pod engine. Yeah. Um, so when I came to Birmingham after they closed the Aberdeen base, I was yeah. flying that jet there. Yeah. Uh, then with um, Flybe, it was the Four Hundred series turboprop. Yeah. Yeah. And then the larger Embraer, so the 195, 175s. So I finished as a captain on the 195, 75s, yeah. Wow, okay. That was a flyby. We were going through troubles and things, then, weren't they? And they're, they're back but, in operation now, aren't they? But it's a different company. Yeah, so there'd always been a, um, a cycle of hire and fire that seemed to be like two yeah. years long. Um, and it just dipped after I retired. I mean, nine months literally after I retired, it went bust. Of course, COVID happened, which would slow up any further action. <laughs> yeah, so um, which was your most enjoyable commercial job, do you think? That's th- that's difficult because it depends on what you're going to measure it against. So obviously, the bush flying um, yeah. was important from the point of view that yeah. you were making a real difference. You know, people yeah. were going to hospital or, or getting their medicines or whatever because yeah. you were there. If you weren't there, that would not have happened. Yeah. Um, and so it felt more significant in some ways than um, the airline flying, where yeah. basically if you are ill or something, you can't fly that day. Someone else just comes in and flies instead of you. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And... Which would you say was your least enjoyable job and why as a commercial pilot? Um, the job itself is is good. It, there are aspects of the job which are the issue. And mm-hmm. I, I would put most of those around the shift working nature of yeah. the job. Yeah. Um, and also the, the transport nature of the job from the point of view of not being at home. And you put those two together and that becomes quite a cocktail to deal with. Yes. Especially when you're doing it decade after decade, which is, of course, what you're doing as an airline pilot. Yeah, absolutely. I've it's heard long-term. that a lot. Yeah, I've heard that a lot that, um, you know, there was a guy who ended up on Mixed Fleet uh, for Tui. And he said he just got fed up of doing long haul stuff on, on 787. In fact, his, his exact words were something on the lines of, if I have to go back to Cancun one more time, <laughs> you know, he, he ended up on 7.3. Um, but that being said, that can be irregular as well, can't it? So Yes, I mean, I was doing the European yeah. um, short haul. I wasn't yeah. doing long haul. Um, and you think that's that's better. And for quite a few years it was actually better it meant I was home most days but towards the end it got more intensive and the company would actually put you into hotels just up the road you know so you might be at the neighboring airfield but not close enough to come home and still in a hotel so So maybe you'd be better off in Cancun yeah exactly yeah (laughs) so yeah I think that's probably a real consideration for anybody going into the industry is is perhaps having a chat with some airline pilots and seeing what the job's about because it, it probably looks a bit more glamorous from the outside to perhaps what it is when you've been doing it yes. many years. Mm-hmm. And I guess you have gone through that. So the benefit of your experience, you can pass on and, and tell people, you know, it can be a, a great job to have, but it can also be quite 
a, you know, a strain on your family and that kind of thing. That's true. It is definitely a family um, issue, I think, because yeah. if you're not there or you can't be there for certain things, when yeah. maybe another type of job, it would be simple. You simply fill in a form or say, I'm not here tomorrow, whatever it happens to be in that particular environment. You can't yeah. do that in the airlines. Yeah. With, with the airlines, if you say, well, this wedding's coming up and I'm going to go anyway, and the service yeah. can go hang, you won't have a job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so one thing is automation in the cockpit I wanted to talk about. Mm. So you've obviously gone from very, very basic flying to um, you know automation in aircraft, and you've seen that journey. Um, what's your opinion on automation, good, bad, or indifferent? Uh, I'd see myself as sort of conventional in saying that really the automation um, can help, but mm. isn't all good by any means. And I think one of the problems you've got is the fact that as an individual, you get into a situation, you need to take over, you yeah. revert to your previous experience to yeah. some degree. Um, and if you haven't got the previous experience because you've grown up and only been trained through automation and you've yeah. got very little else behind that. No yeah, absolutely. Long periods of time actually hand flying or whatever it happens to be that yeah. issue that time. Um, you've got nothing much to revert to. And I think yeah. that sets up a situation. So it, it's almost a secondary aspect of the automation that's the problem, not the primary yeah. aspect. Yeah. The primary aspect, as we all know, is you know, you're pushing the buttons. Um, yeah. Do the right things happen? Does it do what you ex expect it to do or not? Sometimes that can be difficult in its own right. Yeah. But that's really how the automation is designed. Um, one of the things which I thought was very good about the last aircraft I was flying, the Embraer um, 195 jets, was that it just had that nice level of automation. Yeah. And we didn't have full auto land or anything, so we were all doing yeah. manual landing. So it was just a nice combination yeah. where you, you could rely on it and it seemed to do its job, but it didn't yeah. intrude too much. Yeah. Now, I know some airlines are very rigid about their policies about when you should switch autopilots on and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so it's from experience I've had talking to other airline pilots, there seems to be uh, the majority of the flight you are managing systems and crew. Um, and it's only really in critical phases of flight you have the workload's fairly high, so... Yes, I mean, one of the classic ones for us with the, in fact, both types, we were operating in Fly B there towards the end, uh, was that much of the automatics were in for much of the time, but yeah. not during the landing phase normally. Yeah. So that was an advantage to us because you'd find that if you're on a particularly rough day, mm -hmm. and so the aircraft was bumping around, you'd want an approach, yeah. it could overpower the autopilot, for instance. The yeah. autopilot would simply cut itself out and say, I can't do this. Yeah. And you're yeah. hand flying this in challenging conditions yeah, with yeah. no notice. Yeah, right. When you hadn't okay. planned to. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, you've really got to be up there with it. And because yeah. of the practice we got along the way, that was that was fine. You did. Yeah. But if, if the company had decided that it wanted the auto land system fitted and we were to use them at all times, yeah. we'd have been thrown into that situation without that regular practice. And that wouldn't have been so good. No, that's, that's one thing that always... Um, intrigues me about all this automation is mm -hmm. how much training around hand flying the aircraft if these systems break is done in your experience um, I think my actual experience of what happened in the airline was mm -hmm. that you'd have different people come through mm -hmm. and the different managers have slightly different ideas and then they change the checklist they change the procedure mm -hmm. they change the emphasis of certain yeah. bits of training or whatever yeah. and so there was a constant ebb and flow yeah. And that was one of the areas that constantly ebbed and flowed, to be fair, yeah. was you know, some would be emphasising more hand flying, others then would be emphasising more consistency of use of autopilot. And yeah. they'd go back to more hand flying, then back to more autopilot. Yeah. And if you were there long enough, you got the benefit of having done it all. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, so not so much automation, but technology in the cockpit. One of the things as private pilots is that I can remember a time where we everything was dead wrecking and we didn't use, you know, Sky, Sky Demon didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Garmin 430s were relatively new, if you like. Yes. Um, now Garmin 430s are really quite old <laughs> and um, you've got Sky Demon, things that you can use on your iPad. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I like technology in the cockpit to some degree, but I've also had it fail on me as well. And so one of the things I'm really big about is keeping a chart in the copy you should do anyway, it's a legal requirement, but drawing your route on there, having a plug anyway, so that if you do have something fail, you can instantly revert back to dead reckoning or, or whatever you're doing to, to uh, you know, um, get yourself some situational awareness of where you are. Yeah. Um, how do you feel as a flying instructor about technology in the cockpit? 
Well, I, I think that it's there and it can be very helpful, but you shouldn't really rely on it entirely. I think what yeah. you were saying was correct. You've got yeah. um, to back up your electronic procedures with manual ones. Yeah. Because <clears throat> the manual ones will be there for you all the time. Yeah. Um, and again, you need the practice to do that. If, Absolutely. You know, if you're not used to rule of thumb navigation in the air, yeah. it's going to be difficult when all of a sudden you lose your electronics and you're trying to cope with this and you're not used to it. Yeah, your workloads appear and your ability starts to drop, you know. So That's, um, that's right. Yeah. And of course, uh, the thing with private pilots is that often they're not flying very frequently as well. Absolutely. So the recency yeah. angle comes into it. It does, yeah. Um, so the C word, COVID, everyone's fed up for talking about it. I know I am. <laughs> um, it did impact us as a business. Um, it's impacted the airline industry massively. Um, do you think there's any upside in the industry at the minute to COVID? Um, well, what's, what COVID's done is it made people close down. A lot of people left the industry. Um, and being what it is, from everything from security passes through to training and yeah. so on, all the various ticks in the boxes for the CAA. Mm -hmm. I reckon it, it, that needs about two years or so to yeah. recover. Yeah. And so with the people moving on and fresh people coming in, I think there yeah. are a lot of opportunities coming up in the next two years. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we've we've seen fleets retire, we've seen crews retire, you know, so there's people moving up through the ranks and that should then lead to, op you know, opportunities for people who are in training now. Um, so, right, quick fire round then. Um, so, favourite light aircraft? I did like the 185 and I'd like to have one. Yeah. yeah it's such a capable machine. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and that was a tail drag, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, no, it's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, favourite commercial aircraft? Uh, the ones I flew, I definitely liked the, the 195, 175 the most. Yeah. They're really nice, safe yeah. aircraft to handle. Yeah, the Dash looks like an interesting aircraft. It, it does if you watch Birmingham anyway enough. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the Dash, I don't know, it, it's... I think the 400 series dash actually has too large an engine okay. on it. You know, the, the power is too much almost for it. Okay. Uh, the 300 was much sweeter aircraft to fly. Okay. Interestingly enough. Yeah. Is, is there any experience that springs into mind in a light aircraft where you felt like in danger or anything like that? You know, a bad experience you can well, recall? Uh, despite what I've done, you know, we, we did have a lot of training on how to make it mm -hmm. as safe as possible. I haven't had very many experiences okay. at all that are negative. And bush flying, the worst really was just a flat tyre, which is a normal everyday thing. Yeah. Um, the um, only thing around that, of course, was when we were operating in Africa, we did actually have a fatality. Yeah. Um, and dealing with that secondarily, we didn't really understand at first, but come, they were coming to us. And so those people never arrived and we got people coming right. and asking about what had happened. Yeah. And so we had to deal with the aftermath of the accident. And that yeah, was that very unpleasant. Have been unpleasant yeah. no. Okay, worst experience in a commercial aircraft? Again, I've had quite a safe career and that's nice. You know, when you retire, one of the nice tick boxes to say I never had an accident or a real Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, the worst I had actually was just a bit of a brake fire. Okay, that, that so was just, a, just a fire engine following you down the runway. Yeah, sort of air traffic saw the smoke, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> the fire people came out and uh, dealt with it, yes. Yeah. And if money was no object, is there a dream aircraft that you've got that you'd like to fly? Well, when I was at Westlands, we used to go off and do some extra flying experience with other aircraft. And I did get a flight in a twin-seat Hunter. Okay. And that was really something quite special, aerobatic, yeah. um, you know, dials jet 50s yeah. technology so sleek um, i'd really like to have a hunter i think that'd be great yeah i think there's something about vintage aircraft isn't there mm -hmm. it's um i was lucky enough to get a, a ride in the dc3 before it left i sat in the cockpit and and it's just like even just recognizing instruments just because of the way they're printed yeah. um that is just very different very very different so anybody looking to start a career now in aviation um is there anything that you would you know any advice that you would give to them um, I think that they've got to want to do the type of aviation they're going to do and okay. recognise the differences. There are different types of aviation. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I would probably give non-standard advice from the point of view if someone really wants to, to fly, they love the sensations, they like the handling, they, yeah. you know, they love looking out at the countryside. Don't fly airliners because you won't be doing that. You'll be looking down on a cloud. Yes. You won't be, yeah. won't be flying the aircraft. You'll be systems and people managing. Yeah. If you want to do the actual flying, yeah. you know, uh, take up competition aerobatics, go gliding, yeah. um, do other things which are more sports. Perhaps even be an instructor fun. or something. Well, or, potentially, yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to be um, in the industry, yeah. being paid to do it, yes, you could. Yeah, absolutely. Good. And 
If you had your career again, is there anything you would change about it? Or? Well, my career was very broad and I, I did engineering and that was a design degree all the way through to development, helicopters, you know, jets yeah. and small aircraft. And I have actually enjoyed it all. So there's not really much I would change at all. Yeah. That's interesting. Well, thank you very, very much for your time, Derek. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Very interesting. Yeah, you're welcome. If you like this episode, please like, subscribe and ding the bell to receive notifications of the next episode.